All right, uh, welcome to another video on cybersecurity. Uh, specifically this week, I want to look at uh, uh, legal, ethical, and professional issues in uh, information security. So uh, a little pre-warning that some of the materials might be, at least when you, when you get to the law, might seem very um, a US focused because we will be dealing with the uh, US laws. So again, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. All right. So this is uh, our normal uh, bio by myself, how to connect with me on uh, social media or email me. And then again, our normal caveat about what you should do, what this doesn't cover and copyright issues. So this module, basically, I'm going to try and explain to you the difference between laws and ethics, some relevant laws, regulations, and professional organizations in, a, in InfoSec or cybersecurity and trying to identify some major uh, and international laws that affect uh, our practice in the sector. And of course, look at the, also the role of privacy as it applies to laws and ethics in uh, information security. And there's some US national law enforcement agencies. So basically when we're looking at the uh, laws and uh, information security, the whole idea is that for you, if you want to practice in this area, you should at least have some idea about uh, what your ethical and legal responsibilities will be, right? So the whole idea is if you try to minimize your own liability or your own organizational liabilities and, re and risk, why trying to, of course, look at your current legal environment. And you should stay current with the laws and uh, watch for new and emerging uh, uh, issues, right? So for about 16 years, I spent a uh, career as an, uh, as an attorney practicing both in US federal and state court and some international cases. <clears throat> I will go across the border and then try to explain to people what this means for them and what this doesn't mean for them. I used to teach uh, specifically from, uh, I think, Korea, uh, U.S. and other places on issues of, we call the legal aspects of doing business in the U.S. And then my first foray into formal academia was as a professor of business law and ethics. So this is actually talking about a... Uh, 22 years later to really do this video. So laws basically are enforced by the state and it's compulsory, or you say the word mandatory. Uh, usually in the democratic system, you have three uh, branches of government, right? The executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. And you'll be told that the executive, is, the judiciary is the one that makes law and that the executive uh, enforces it but when the so so the legislative branch makes the law and then the executive is supposed to enforce it but however when the judiciary uh make you even interpret an act or a portion of the constitution they're also making the law but but the process is your legislator will draft the bill and then the bill gets voted on goes through reading before it comes before the House of Reps or the House of Senate or House of Lords or House of Commons, whatever you have in your own area, or the House of Assembly. And then you vote and it, and it now goes to the governor or the president to be signed into law. Once it's signed, it becomes an act. If the president, as an example, does not agree with it, and he, he can now veto the bill. But many society or many go, uh, countries have a rule that says, two-thirds majority of the legislative branch can override the veto of the president, and it still becomes law, right? So if you're reading an act, you will see on the bottom whether it was signed by the president or not, right? Ethics, on the other hand, are basically what we call uh, things to regulate your, your behavior socially. The word cultural morals be like uh, moral attitudes. Uh, so for law, whether it's the administrative law, civil law, uh, criminal law, there are consequences to violating them, right? In the case of a uh, civil law, which would be either uh, corporate law for business or what's called tort, like negligence, uh, hitting somebody with your car or uh, assault. Uh, because even assault could be both criminal and civil, right? You you get to, you get a fine, you get a monetary judgment, which is how most of us made money as a lawyer. And then the criminal one, you're going to go to jail, if it's less than a year, in most places it's called a misdemeanor or felony if it's more than a, a year, right? All right. So sometimes you have restitution, you have to pay back money for that. 
So the word jurisdiction means uh, the right or the authority of a court to hear your case. And there are two types of uh, jurisdiction, really, personal jurisdiction or long-arm jurisdiction. I know uh, you do have what they call subject matter jurisdiction, but on here, when it talks about long-arm jurisdiction, see, it's for laws that applies to those who are not even in the court jurisdiction, right? But because maybe you did something within that jurisdiction or you left or you entered a contract and you agreed, right? So you have issues about also due care, due diligence in law. Now, they want you to know the distinction between policies and laws. It's kind of like unique because usually you've heard the expression that says ignorance of the law is not an excuse, but it says ignorance of policies to be an excuse, right? So if you're looking at the hierarchy of uh, what organizations deal with in terms of rules, or you have your, you know, your policies on top that is normally from a top management, or you have strategy uh, policies, and of course way down to like uh, uh, guidelines, right? So you're just telling that policies here are from uh, the management, and they will be considered the laws of your organization, like acceptable use policy technology, what you can do on the internet and what you cannot do on that uh, internet using uh, the company's uh, network, right? All right, so, so for a policy to be enforceable, it needs to be disseminated, meaning everybody needs to be able to have access to it, right? Reading of it, understand it, agreement to comply by it, and of course, uh, uniform enforcement. Those are some attributes of uh, uh, a policy that's required for it to be enforceable. So see this little slight uh, knowledge check. So business policy functions as dash law and must be crafted and implemented with care to ensure they are complete, appropriate, and fairly applied to everyone, right? So if you talk about business policies functions as, right, you would be organization, right? All right, so there, as I said, there are different types of laws. You got the regulation. So the only thing I didn't touch about was the constitution and common law. Common law would be for like former British colonies, uh, like you hear the word common law wife, that like just by virtue of living together after so many years, you become wives or something. Uh, it's not really like codified, like uh, written down somewhere that like says you have to go get a court certificate to get married. But you might have maybe have court cases that interpret uh, the living together to mean uh, that you are now legally married after so many years. Or in the case of property too, if you are squatting on a property after so many years in some jurisdiction, you become the owner of the property. Now, the constitution is considered the supreme law of the land. Every other law falls down and uh, falls below it. So you keep that in mind. If you ever hear, hear somebody ask you, what is the supreme law of the land? It tends to be constitution. In a place that has constitution, right? Even with democratic regime or military regime or authoritarian regime, they still have a constitution, right? So this is the portion I, I warned you ahead of time might be very uh, American-centric because if you're watching this from another part of the world, just try and see is there something comparable in your country, right? So, but the whole idea is because the U.S. has been part of uh, uh, a leader in the development of uh, information security legislation, we have to look at some of their laws as an example, right? Of course, now with the United Nations and other international bodies, they're also having... Um, laws that affect uh, information security, right? So the reason why the U.S. passes laws is because they want to encourage business in information security perspective. So the first thing here is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. Uh, it says, we call it the, uh, like, the, it paved the way for many computer-related uh, federal and uh, federal enforcement uh, laws. You have what's also called the National Infrastructure Protection Act in the U.S., and then you have the U.S. Patriot Act that grew out of the whole 9-11. Uh, the whole idea here with 9-11 is that it kind of like made permanent 14 of the 16 previously expanded powers of the Department of Homeland Security and FBI investigating like terrorist activity. And then you also have the USA Freedom Act. And then uh, the Computer Security Act of 1987 was like the first attempt by the U.S., to look into uh, IT. So you've got FISMA. When you hear FISMA, it mostly has to do with federal agencies, okay? And then um, let's talk about privacy. So many countries have their own laws of privacy. 
Uh, if you're in the European uh, Union area, you heard about the GDPR. If you're in California, you heard of the California Privacy Act. But the whole idea is that this is a very hot topic in cybersecurity. In fact, a lot of my lawyer colleagues, they will leave the practice of law and become like a data protection officers or get more into a, a privacy, right? So pri like GDPR has about the right to be forgotten. So the whole idea is that every individual group has the right to protect themselves and their information from unauthorized access. In other words, remember the, the CIA tried in cybersecurity, they want to have a confidentiality, right? So there's so many laws now that sometimes it's difficult to keep uh, abreast of them dealing with privacy. So because there's so much information coming from everywhere, we need to be concerned really about the uh, privacy. So I could have titled this thing laws, privacy and ethics, but you know, because privacy legislation will come under law, that's okay. Right. So US uh, regulation like the privacy of uh, customer information, the Federal Privacy Act, Electronic Communication Act, and then the HIPAA, which is also called uh, the Kennedy Casting Bomb Act, has to do with the healthcare industry. It's a very big law in the US protecting healthcare information. So uh, again, the US centric question, which of the following is another name for Financial Service uh, Modernization Act. That would be our uh, Graham, uh, Graham Leach uh, Biley Act for, for US uh, students. Okay. Let's talk about identity theft. I have been a victim of identity theft. I was overseas on a contract. When I came back to file my tax return, I was like, hey, you already filed your tax return. In fact, we gave you $8,000. Somebody had actually stolen my information and pretended uh, to be me. So it's, it's very rampant. And I remember going to the police and they're like, oh, this happens a lot. Uh, and the way it happened was considered the, the uh, mainstay of uh, identity fraud in, uh, in the US, right? So somebody steals your personal identifier information, PII, uh, maybe a national ID number, and then uh, poses as you. So the US FTC has some F, uh, efforts of what to do, and then the, there's another law there. So usually in the US, you just report, and then uh, they check. In my case, they check, and be like, okay, we know it wasn't you. But that means if you want to do certain things, you need to notify the US government or get a special uh, code, right? So this is what you do if you suspect that you've been a victim of identity theft. So now there's this here, Espionage, uh, Economic Espionage Act law. You hear people saying that uh, one particular country in Asia is very good at uh, spying on systems. They will plant malware and they will stay there and they steal your information. So you have acts to cover that uh, for purposes of uh, commercial espionage. And then you got the Encryption Act. There's, a, there's something that's not covered here, but those of us that do like foreign... Um, Consulting, there's something called ITA, International Transport of Arms Regulation. You'll be aware of it. It's going to be teaching, like even cybersecurity. You'll be like, why cybersecurity uh, uh, um, governed by arms regulation? Just know that it is governed. You need to be careful what you do when you're teaching, like hacking or ethical hacking uh, in different parts of the world, right? All right. So uh, let's U.S. intellectual property IP, not not for inter, not for internet uh, protocol IP as well as intellectual property. There are really four types. You got your trade secrets for your business. You got your copyright for your written work. You've got your trademark. Um, am I missing something? And then patent for invention, right? Those are the four general areas you should be aware of for intellectual property, right? Uh, it's protected under US law. So you can, uh, but there's exclusions for fair use, right? That's a website. So what happened with copyright is sometimes you have to register your copyright in more than one jurisdiction to make sure you don't become a victim. And there are international copyright regulations that you should probably be aware of. But that's another uh, class here. So this is a question. Intellectual, intellectual property includes all of the following except the recipe, the recipe to make cook, an article from the New York Times, uh, this uh, Cengage's logo for a, a company, right? That we use their books also. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes and then the process to manufacture an iPhone you will be surprised about the answer. The answer here is the adventures of Sherlock Holmes because copyright has a fixed period of time. In this case, the work of fiction is no longer protected by copyright because it has uh, expired. Since you with some of the patent too. You have a reasonable amount of time depending on your country, how many years you can enjoy the fruits of your invention. All right, so Sabine Oxley, you might not be aware of the Enron, but just know that this was came out of... Uh, 
issues about concerns about what auditing firms were doing, publicly accounting, public accounting firms. I happen to have worked for Pricewaterhouse, but this didn't cover Pricewaterhouse. It's for another uh, uh, accounting firm, right? So the whole idea here is that, um, so you hear Sibir Knox is called uh, SOX, right? So how do we make sure that the accounting information that is provided by a publicly traded company is accurate? So there's, there's uh, penalties for non-compliance. You can pay money or you can go to jail. It used to be before accounting firms who just do and don't have any liability or the CEO just sign like a public disclosure or tax. Now you could be personally liable for signing those documents. Also, Freedom of Information Act, which you hear the word, we as an attorney, we call it FOIA, allows us to have access to uh, agency records. So this, you're going to encounter a lot in your uh, cybersecurity or privacy or InfoSec career, which is the PCIDSS, which is the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It's actually not a law. It's more like... Um, a voluntary compliance with some kind of guideline, right? So this the the whole idea is to encourage anybody that uh, or any entity that processes debit card or credit card to adopt certain security features, right? Uh, so you, you call it consistent data security measures. So there's some kind of uh, what called technical baseline and operational requirements. So anybody that processes uh, credit card must. Uh, abide by this. So this is a chat about some of the uh, areas and the requirement, right? Protect your cardholder data, uh, encrypt transmission of the card across open uh, public network. So the, the, maintain your vulnerability management uh, program, right? Have an infosec policies. All right, so state and local regulations. I can also add international here. So you have federal laws and also you have to be aware of your state uh, laws, right? So if you're practicing as a cybersecurity analyst, infosec professional, you have the responsibility to understand the state regulations and make sure that you are in compliance with it, right? Same thing with international law. Um, but the issue is, so now, for example, now cybercrime. There really is no international agreement on, on cybercrime. There's something called the Budapest uh, Convention, but not all countries have uh, signed to it, right? But imagine this, I'm, so I'm sitting... Uh, to this this video, I'm making this video today from uh, Dubai. So let's say I use my crime, my computer to commit a crime on the internet uh, against somebody in America. So uh, which law is going to apply to me? The law of the United Arab Emirates or the law of the U United States of America? So you can see there are issues, right? Because there may be complexities of uh, countries. Just know that there are... I, for example, if I'm kind of... Like jammers, for example, are, are illegal, right, for jamming signals. But maybe some countries might just allow you to go by. Some countries, they see or they see hacking tools with you, you're going to go to jail. So just be careful, right? So know about international law, right? So you have a Council of European Convention on Cybercrime. They made some attempt, But the question is, how can you enforce the law? And then the World uh, uh, Trade Organization also has uh, some aspects related to uh, intellectual property, and which means also related to tech, right? So the whole, f uh, there's five areas that is covered on there. Uh, how do you dispute intellectual property? And then it goes on. So now, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA. This is from, this is a U.S. law. It has to do with uh, efforts to reduce the impact of copyright, trademark, and privacy infringement, right? So you had another European one, so they're trying to make sure they are compliant with it. All right, so ethics and information security. Um, there might not be any like binding codes for IT, but many organizations have their own uh, prescribed ethical conduct. In other words, you're going to be a member of our organization. You're going to be certified with us. This is what you must abide by. All right, so this is called the 10 Commandments of Computer Ethics or by the Computer Ethics Institute. There's 10, just like the Ten Commandments, the Biblical Ten Commandments, or uh, uh, the Jewish one also, right? You should not use your computer to harm other people, uh, to interfere with other people's work, uh, snoop other people's computers' files, steal files, be a false witness, um, copy proprietary software without paying for it, um, use other people's computer resources without authorization, 
uh, do not appropriate somebody else's intellectual property, right? And then, of course, uh, shall not think you thou shall think about the social consequence of the program you're writing or the system you are designing. Thou shall always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for your fellow humans. I'm also a member of the Humanistic uh, uh, Leadership uh, Academy HLA. So when I see that last portion, I smile because myself and my fellow professors in the cohort, or even when I was doing my MBA, I had to be a member of the MBA. We understand this part about things that consider your fellow human beings, right? Making businesses work for everybody. All right, so the issue now is that different cultures have different ethics. Uh, so what exactly is, and it's not ethical, if you see the little slide to your right of your screen, where you've got, I don't know how you're looking at it, you got the skills of justice, and you got a three-way uh, arrow I have on there one says right, wrong, depend. Some countries, bribery is uh, part of doing business. Uh, some people say uh, having more than one wife is uh, uh, allowed in a culture, whether or having more than one girlfriend, uh, using software you didn't pay for. So in the study in ethics, and as I said, in 2001, I started teaching business law and ethics at the university in, uh, in South Florida. To today, the whole idea is that uh, different cultures may have different views on what is ethical, so just understand it. Uh, because ethics has a lot to do with uh, cultural mores or morals, right? All right, so education is the overriding factor in leveling our perceptions of ethics within any kind of population. So you must train your employees. It's very, very important. Uh, but to deter ethical and illegal behavior, you first have to understand what causes people to behave in an unethical or an illegal manner. It's always said that uh, people behave, uh, three things can make people behave illegally or unethical. Ignorance, or by accident, or intent. So usually in law, to commit a crime, you have to have two things. You call the mens rea, right? Which is in your mind and the intent, and then the actus rea, the actual act that you've done, right? To be convicted, right? So, so deterrence is best method to prevent this from happening, right? Whether it be by laws, policies, or technical controls, actually, in an organization. So uh, it must be fair, and you have fear of penalty, probability of being apprehended. Look at this chart in here. Speeding tickets. So like uh, in some parts of the world, you, you, even if you don't even see a police, you're going to get a ticket in your, mail, in your mail or in your box if you go past the speed limit with the camera. So if you know that you can be apprehended and you know that it's a penalty and you know that it's applied universally, you know, these are deterrent to ethical or illegal behavior. So as I said, most organizations have their own code of conduct or ethics. You've got the uh, ACM, ISACA, which I belong to, ISSA, which I belong to, right? Um, I have the CISM certification from uh, ISACA, which is certifi Certified Information Security Manager. You have the ISC2 also. You have SANS. Uh, the SANS is pretty good. A lot of their certifications are expensive. You have the EC Council. They do the ethical uh, hacking right? certification, right? So this is the ACM, Computing Machinery. They have their own separate code of ethics. You got the SANS. So Systems Administration Network and Security Institute. That was the original name for SANS. And it's a very large organization, very, very reputable. The ESA, as I said, I'm a member of this, but there are branches in UAE and in the US, and then the EC Council also. So Homeland Security, I already talked about as related to um, uh, Patriot Act, all kind of 9-11, right? Uh, protect American citizens as well as physical and information assets of the United States. So, cybersecurity role extends from a cybersecurity infrastructure security agency. This is CISA. Some of these are good places to also get an um, update. US CERT is a good way for having information on uh, phishing and malware reports. So, this is an example of CISA incident reporting system. You can go online to their website and check it out. All right. So, US agency, most people know about FBI. Uh, they have their most wanted list. NSA, if you follow in artificial intelligence, we know that uh, as of uh, last week, they've now created a special section dealing with uh, artificial intelligence. So this is the US uh, crypto Cryptological Association. If you remember, cryptology is the study of 
you got cryptography and crypto analysis underneath it, right? So crypto cryptography, process of encrypting, right? And then crypto analysis trying to to break a or crack it if you want to use a, a non-formal term, right? All right, so uh, knowledge which federal is most responsible for developing and using encryption, know this NSA. All right, so that's the summary of what we covered. Please send, feel free to send me any questions. I uh, hope the video is not too long. But if I was summarizing, just understand that laws are regulated, are really backed up by governments, and they have consequences such as financial or criminal for what's called um, breaking the law. And then ethics is more of uh, moral principles as to how you should behave. And it's, I hate to use the word, in general, it's, ex it's, uh, it's ex expected that it's, more like voluntary unless you belong to an association or uh, an organization and you breach it then of course it can be a, a fire or terminated thank you uh, as always click share um, uh, subscribe and then you can receive a further notification for upcoming uh, video